and welcome if this is your first time visiting a special welcome to you we got a special feature today we are doing a driving tour of negro jamaica particularly focusing on the west end and this is a bit of a long video it's about 38 40 minutes and depending on where you're watching it this will be in different parts or one long video my name is Winthrop wellington by the way and here on my channel we really discuss all things Jamaica, but today, as I mentioned, we're gonna be doing a bit of tour of Negril, and we're just gonna flow with it. We're just gonna flow with it and see where this takes us. So we are starting this tour off on Norman Manley Boulevard, otherwise known as the Beach Road at Travelers Beach Resort, which is my family's hotel. And of course we got a wait for traffic but of course there on the left side of your screen that is our neat resource center or the negro education environment trust resource center uh, neat is my family's nonprofit organization which focuses on education for young people so right now we're heading south on norman Manley boulevard pretty beautiful day as you can see i don't know what the temperature was when we when we filmed this but <laughs> It was, it was nice. It was a nice day. And so we're heading towards downtown Negril. And on your left is the shared user path. So that's running, Bye, walking, Bye, biking. Bye. And that goes for a little bit over two miles. To your right is the Negril Beach Park. Uh, it has a basketball court oh, I'm sorry. I'm and the there. beach, of course. And just really open space. Unfortunately, it's closed right now. They are, or they have plans to do some refurbishing and then we just passed the community Grill community center and they were also passing the craft market on your right side and this is the south negro river and bridge and we're heading to the negro roundabout of course going into the roundabout you have to give way and if you're in the roundabout you have the right of way and we are going west end so we're going to be taking a right here at the roundabout and veering left and so here downtown this is uh, a few shopping centers if you will there's little caesar's pizza on the right popeyes burger king there's a digicel store down here as well and on the left coming up is scotia bank which some people might be familiar with, depending on where you are from, but it's a Canadian bank. And I guess officially, this is where the West End of Negro starts. And on your left here is Corner Bar, which is a pretty popular restaurant. Great, great local food. Haven't had it in a while, but the reviews continue to be, to be very, very good. And on the left, that's Fender's Plaza. That's the Negril Chamber of Commerce uh, owned plaza. And on the right, obviously, we have the C. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we panned right, but it's you basically can see the entirety of Negril on the right hand side if you were to look right. You need to get a 360 camera next time, right? Anyway, on the left is the Negril Post Office, not in the greatest of shapes, but that is our post office. And then right after that is Samuel's Hardware on the left. And that's, I would say, probably the most popular hardware store in Negril. Uh, mostly every business uses them. And then on the left, the green building, that's Quality Traders. That's where I do my grocery shopping. Been going there for years. And then we're coming up on the, I guess what used to be the high low value, high low value master NCB Plaza, but uh, NCB and high low moved. So that's no longer there. And that place is being refurbished. And this is called Church Corner. As we move through the West End. Just cruising, just cruising. And this is the Negril Library on the left, and then followed by Negril All Age School. And then this is another hardware store on the left. A 
Hope you guys are enjoying this so far. I'm just, I'm just following with it. And Afternoon, everyone, and welcome to what I would call our first emergency live stream. And I know we've never done anything like this before, and we've actually never uh, live streamed on a Saturday, as a matter of fact. But I thought it was just so fitting and so needed to uh, do this stream because there are some unprecedented things that are happening in the grill that really do need to be addressed and talked about. And they've been going on for quite some time. And so uh, for those who are visiting for the first time, my name is Winthrop Wellington. And normally on my channel, I help people move to and invest in Jamaica. And we do that through a variety of different types of content, uh, mainly a podcast that I have. Uh, but today, as, as mentioned, uh, we're doing something a little bit different here. And it's important to me that we use this platform uh, more as a tool to get information out and uh, hopefully, hopefully help people more than anything else. So I've invited a few members of the Negro community, leaders in the Negro community, to join the discussion today. And I would like to give them the opportunity to introduce themselves and then also um, and then after that, we'll get into the discussion. So if you have any questions, we will try our best to get to them uh, throughout throughout this discussion. Uh, we will uh, we will save them and try to get to them later. Uh, so we want to make this uh, as interactive as possible. Uh, so with no further ado, I'd like to give it over to Simone to introduce herself. Thank you, Winthrop. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Simone Goff. I'm a resident of Negril also a business consultant and a director from the Negril Chamber of Commerce. Uh, good afternoon, I am Daniel Grizzle, a founding member of the Negril Chamber of Commerce, managing director of Sharela Inn, and a current director. Hi, afternoon everyone. My name is Damien Salmon. I'm the first vice president of the chamber currently, and uh, the owner and operator of uh, Rock House and Skylark here in Nickville. I guess, I guess to start the discussion today, um, th there's a lot going on in Negro that I, I think we can all say that we are quite disappointed in. And a lot of it has been to a point that we've never seen before. And particularly with, uh, I would say, the fires and the water. And I guess that's where I would like to start with getting, if we can kind of just not assume that everybody knows what's going on or what's happening, uh, if we can just go through particularly, let's start with the morass fires that um, unfortunately earlier this week and last week, it was just really, really terrible. And I uh, just want to open up the discussion to that if somebody wants to happen. Well, I was just going to say that I think that it's, it's important for people to understand the, the ecology of Negril is very specific. And and the, the morass and the beach and the reef, for example, are three elements that, that all link together to make part of that ecosystem work. And the truth of the matter is that, of course, you know, the morass was a morass because of the water that came was coming into there historically from uh, the springs at the, at the back of the hills of the Negril Hills, which, which many years ago was, uh, that flow was stemmed so to dry the morass. And it's one of the reasons that we have such terrible fires um, in the morass because it's so dry. Um, I'm not getting into the Iwiko right now because that's another thing, but that's the part of that was to, to try and alleviate that as a problem. Um, but it's really important to understand the relationship between the morass and the beach and the reef and, and how the morass acts when it's in, in good condition as a, um, a large filter pretty much and filters water through then runs through the water table and then out highly oxygenated water to feed the to to sustain the beach and the um and the seagrass beds and then obviously to the to the reef as well creating creating fish habitat and things like that too and so you know when when as happened last week you know or um when the fire gets so out of hand crazy as it was you know and the conditions seem to be just perfect for it with with quite a bit of breeze around and and um, high temperatures and of course no rain of course it, that's the other problem with not having not having water is is that we we're in the middle of a drought obviously those two things are linked but um uh it's that's not just something that that is just happening here in the grill that's really a, a jamaica thing and in fact obviously weather patterns are changing all over the world it seems 
Um, and so uh, I, that situation that existed last week with the, with the morass was, uh, it was like the worst it's been for quite a while, I would say. And the most impactful it's been as well too, with, with the amount of fire, the amount of soot and thing. I know quite a few people had problems with, with breathing and things like that as well too, which was really uh, an appalling situation. No, thank you for that. I think it's, like you said, it's like so important to understand like how important the morass is to our ecosystem and just how, how delicate it is. I mean, pretty much we don't have the morass, we don't have the reefs, we don't have the beach, you know, and they, they all work together and people love coming to Jamaica, they love coming to the grill to enjoy it, but we have to do our part to maintain and, and preserve it. And you alluded to Iwego and Rewetting it, which we'll get into because we have Sophie Grizzle coming coming shortly, and we're going to dive deep into deep into that. Um, but is there anything that we can do, or we can, or should be doing now, to like help with that? Well, you know, the, the, <laughs> this was the whole Iweco project. It's difficult to talk about talk about that no, without right. without, so, without talking about the Iweco project, really, to be right. honest, because that was the one of the major major uh, uh, effects of what that was supposed to do would, would be to re-wet the morass and to, to create a different ecological zone to be able to control the fires, certainly, largely, um, not 100%, but, but obviously to be able to largely control that. And so I don't know that there's much that we can be done right now, short of having a helicopter standing by waiting, waiting to uh, be able to dump seawater onto it when, <laughs> when, when it happens. Well, I think what can we do as a community regarding the morass and the fire? First of all, it's nice to let the outer public know what we have done regarding that. And what we have done, we have managed to put forward a proposal to raise $3 million to deal with it. We have also, over the years, bring in the best world's professional scientific people to advise us what needs to be done. We have done all that. And therefore, the only thing left for us to do now is to see that we can educate the rest of Jamaica the need that we must preserve the wetland. So, as you rightly said, so we can preserve the reef, so we can have a beach, so we can have an industry. And this is one of the things we now have to do. Maybe it may sound a bit far-fetched, but maybe we have to educate our political leaders of the importance, because I got a feeling it hasn't really registered in their brain how important it is if you want to have an industry a tourism industry here in Negril. And with that, you had mentioned, Damien, that there's this kind of, a con there's multiple things happening and contributing, and one of them being the drought and not having water. So the drought is like, it's causing two issues. It's uh, obviously the, the, the peat, the morass is, is very dry and it's, you know things are flaming up, but then also, from just a um, quality of life standpoint, we as humans living here in the grill in the community, we don't have water. And uh, it's probably been, and you guys can correct me on this, is like probably the worst for the for the West End. That's what I'm hearing more than anything yeah. else. Like they haven't had it in months. Yeah. The further deep west you go, the you know, the every now and again and and the schedule that NWC have us on that, you know, the West End's supposed to get water Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Well, Maybe they're doing that, but there's just no water in the pipes, regardless of whether they say that the, the water is being turned up there. But the truth is, to get water to the West End, you need to fill the tank up Westland Mountain Road. That's really where the head pressure comes from. And so, yes, you can fill that tank, but there's unfortunately, there's a lot of extraneous pipes coming out of that tank and coming off the line that feeds that tank and things that, that um, are not really regulated. And so it's difficult for the tank. Once the tank is full, then you should theoretically have, have water all the way down the West End. But I, 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 someone going and checking to see that that tank is full every day, you know, or how much water is in that tank, because otherwise you won't get pressure on the West End. 
but don't you think we have a more serious problem? To fill the tanks and to supply water, you have to have the volume somewhere else coming in. Mm. The amount of water coming into Negril hasn't changed for 25 years. The population, the residential population, has multiplied some 10 or 20 times. The hotel rooms multiply again some 10, 20 times. And yet, nothing has been done to increase the volume of water coming into Negril. Mm. So, you know, you can only share the little you have. That's true. And, and that is the problem. We have been talking to the authorities seriously for at least the last 10 years about increasing the flow of water to Negril. We have had promises. But until now, none of those promises have really come true. And that's where we can't share more than what we have. And that is the problem. While the population has grown, while the number of hotel room has grown, while the Minister of Tourism has done a fantastic job in attracting more airlift and we get our share, the things that are most important, which water is one of them, hasn't increased. Mm. And I think that's what, how do we get it across to the authorities that they need to deal with this very, very important commodity? Mm. It seems like we're putting the cart before the horse in a lot of this. Yes. Um, and, and then I, I feel like we, we've also discussed this in terms of the, uh, the sewage system as well and concerns of outgrowing that mm -hmm. and what the implications of that could be. And so, um, like you said, I think the, the minister is doing a great job. We're growing, uh, we're getting lots and lots of visitors coming in from destinations that never came before, but it's also creating a, not a bit, a lot of havoc down, down the stream, but it's just like, what are we going to do? Because it's, we're continuing to go down this path. And a lot of people also think, I don't know if there's any truth to this or anybody can shed any light on this, that, um, a lot of these large hotels that are coming online that that is also contributing to the problem. Well, they say, like, you know, I, I know that there are there are things that, uh, for example, Princess is trying to do, like with, with sinking wells, and I hear also that they're, they're planning to do des desalination down there as well too. And I believe Royalton are doing the same thing as well, um, which obviously is something to do, but there are issues with all of these processes, of course. You know, if everyone wants to sink a well, we could easily have, uh, quite quite another problem with the salt the salt water coming back into the system and, and uh, making making different problems or desalination has its own series of problems with it too that there are issues that it can that it can cause in the in the environment so yeah I don't you know uh, I don't really know otherwise than that and as Daniel says you know there's things like they've talked about bringing the water bringing the pipe all away from Great River come down that's which I believe stopped in Lucy. Um, and they and they didn't bring it any further, and but also the you know we hear the even the prime minister talking about even Roaring River and bringing water from the other side to feed the the system as well too, um, and you know that's been committed to and um, let's see if it happens. And Simone, like how have you been affected or hearing the effects of uh, both the water and the morass? Well, uh, definitely with respect to the water. Um, neighbors you know my heart goes out to those women who came home from the hospital who live on the west end you know with that newborn and no water in the pipes for weeks upon weeks so um i believe that more persons it's not just for those who are affected just everyone as a people because we care about each other or we ought to care about each other we all should do what we can to get um to get the government and the officials to help us in this situation. You know, uh, at the end of the day, they are public servants. They're there to serve us, the people. And so we need to hold them accountable. So what I want is for 
persons to get together, irrespective of what political party you're a part of, what community you're a part of. Let's get together and hold these people accountable. And with that, I, I think also part of the problem is like, obviously the reality of the situation of not having water and, you know, that's a horrible situation of like coming home to the hospital and having a child and not having running water. Right. That's ridiculous. But then also there's just like a huge lack of communication. Like we just don't know what's going on. As you mentioned, Damien, there's a schedule that seemingly is not being kept and people are upset and frustrated as they should be. And so it's like, all right, what's, can we at least, excuse me, can we at least have somebody or like just accurate information? And I think that's what's also frustrating people. Like, is there an end to this? Is it like, you know, is it the drought? Is it, are we never going to get water back? Because it's like, we just don't, we just don't know. Mm. I mean, the other thing too is, is that I think that this, there's a lot that we, we can do for ourselves. Like I think, um, you know, uh, collecting rainwater, for example, um, is 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 something that we do a lot on our properties. Um, I mean, though there's no rain currently, you know, so that's an issue. But hopefully soon we'll start getting some rain, and when we do, um, you know, our tanks will f our our tanks will fill. Now there's a lot there's a lot of infrastructure, and there's a lot of I mean, you know, that can be a very expensive undertaking to start guttering roofs and tanking, and then filtering and cl and clarifying water. Um, but um, it's certainly something that can be done, you know. And I, I, I really, I, I would implore that the, the, the to make to make um, water harvesting a mandatory on all, you know, new construction. It seems like a reasonable thing to do. It seems like madness not to do it. In fact, actually, yeah, it, it's funny because years ago we sent that proposal to the ministry that for residential homes you should not pass the permit unless there was some form of water harvesting and it can be done and it should be done it's not the answer for all our problem because let's face it you have a hotel even a hundred rooms you're not going to be able to harvest water but you can harvest enough water to keep you for a day or two but at the same time, we have to hold the authorities responsible for providing water for the industry because you have to look at this air in the grill. A couple of years ago, this time of the year, you go around and Froom would be humming. There would cane shocks and people would be employed. That doesn't exist anymore. The only economical activity we have in this part of the island is tourism and it feeds the agriculture it feeds into trade it, it carries the economy and therefore the government also reap reward from the economical activities in terms of gct people spend money and 15 percent of it goes back to the state so it's an investment from the state to provide us with what we need to function successfully. And I think what we definitely have to do as a community is for the chamber, the JHTA, to go directly to the prime minister, have a meeting with him and his minister of finance, and not to go and quarrel or to have a argument, is to put to them, the investment possibility, because from the government, it's an investment. Mm. Bringing us water is an investment yeah. for them. Yeah. Right? And you also have some responsibility for the social well-being of the people who lives in the area. And as she just explained, imagine a woman coming home from hospital, turn mm. on the pipe, nothing comes out of it. What's the use of a government if they cannot provide these basic? And it's our responsibility to bring this to them, not to some representative down the road, because we've been doing that and we're not getting anywhere. Mm. So we have to now take our complaint. We have to now sit down with those at the very top who can make a difference. because. I don't think it's a money problem. 
I think there is enough money. It's a question of, do we really, is this really important for us? Is this something we have to do? Is this something we must do? That's what we have to get across to them. But as you say, quite rightly, Daniel, it seems that like this is an investment. This mm -hmm. would be something that the government effectively would be investing in the future of Negril, mm -hmm. creating a better water supply system, for yeah. example, and a better power system. You know, there's a whole yeah. bunch of things. There's a string of things that that they could do. And and as you say, that the, the TEF is bringing in all this money into mm -hmm. the country. Well, people are bringing in this, all this money that goes to the TEF. Um, that is the Tourism Enhancement Fund. And what, what what better place to 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 spend it on providing basic structure for the tourism industry? Exactly, TEF. That's what this fund for. Can tourism. you explain what that is for everybody? The tourism fund. The tourism enhancement fund is each guest arrive in this country. There is a twenty dollar charge every time you buy a ticket, and not only from the tourists but even jamaicans returning yeah. yeah right if you go out of this island three times for the year it's three times you have paid as long as you buy a ticket mm. you pay that money and that fund is put together to as it says enhance the product now water is one of the most important thing you can use to enhance that product mm. and therefore we cannot talk about the lack of money we have got poor management we have had lack of a vision but lack of money in this case is not our problem and the only thing we as ordinary citizen can do is to go to the top of the government chain and try and impress and also to let not just we few in the business community but the entire community yeah because it's not just hotels no. that are suffering since we a lot of my staff oh we couldn't make it to work this uh today because we couldn't get a shower we couldn't clean our clothes so it's not just an industry problem mm. It's the entire community, and therefore the entire community must speak up against it. So that's what we have to do. That's what the Chamber and the JHTA is trying to organize. And I think we can say we have sent a letter off to the Prime Minister asking for a small audience, a representative of the community, to sit down and get across this very, very serious problem. Have we heard anything from any leadership? No, uh, we have not. <laughs> we have not. That's so crazy. And um, you touched on uh, the idea of there seems to be a lack of communication. I agree with you. There is a disconnect between the agencies. And uh, um, I think that, for example, the NWC, what is their mandate? It shouldn't be because we are a tourist um, resort town why we should be lobbying for water. Jamaicans live in the grill. Jamaicans need the basic water. You know, um, think of the children who are supposed to go to school to get an education. If they don't have water in their homes, how are they going to go out? You know, how are they going to prepare themselves to go out to school? So I believe... Um, the persons who are in charge of the various government agencies, they need to go back to the books and say, what am I here for? What is this agency's directive? And then they need to just do their jobs. To me, it's just as simple as that. And like, do you think something like this would be accepted or would happen in Kingston? Well, I know that they have had a lot of water issues in Kingston. Talking particularly about like having no information I, on what's going on. What's well, that's happening. yeah. Well, that's true. I mean, it's, it just seems like we we seem to be literally in the dark yeah. down here. You Always. know, it's like we're the other end of the island and the last last place to get water, last place to get power. Like and sort of it it you can't help feeling that we've been forgotten about. Right. That's that's literally how I feel. 
you know, and I think a lot of people in the community, you know, there were a few demonstrations on the road, which I don't blame them for doing, um, that they are just, they just feel left out. They feel voiceless. They feel like nobody is sticking up for them. Nobody's hearing that, like, we haven't had water in months. What's going on? Yeah. And, and, and you know, one of the sad things, as you rightly says, we are f forgotten. There is only one thing we are not forgotten for. Apart from the Golden Triangle in Kingston, we pay the highest land tax. So we are not completely forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> not when it comes to collecting taxes. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. The highest land tax is here in the grill. Mm apart from the Golden Triangle in Kingston. Mm. So th these are some of the things that makes you angry in a sense, right? When you're not asking for the moon, you're just asking for something that is available. Now, another thing which a lot of people are now starting to grumble about, the cruise, you have some mega cruise ship comes into Montego Bay. And they're all get their tanks filled with water. Mm. Right? These are people <laughs> who are here for a few hours. Yeah. Right? In the residence. We are here. I, of course, you have to give them water. Have no problem. But the government make it a priority to ensure that there was water there so they could get. Similar. They can make it important enough for us to get water for we who live here 365 days of the year we who pay our taxes in a ho the hotel industry pays about eight tax different taxes each year i mean you just don't know where they're coming from they just keep coming okay we have no <laughs> problem with that right i mean you should feel proud to pay your taxes but you should also expect to get something, some basic things for the community. And as you rightly says, it's not just the tourist industry because our workers are here mm. 365 days a year. How can a family function without water in this modern times? And, I mean, and that example of how is like, it's such a huge slap in the face. You know, a, a ship comes here, traveling with tourists and visitors, and they're able to get their their tanks filled up and mm -hmm. go off and set sail for the next country. And why, why the people here can't get water? Yeah, and, and listen, the pipes are now in Lucy, by in front of the courthouse. I think that's where it stopped. Right now. I think you take it, it's about maybe 30 miles, if that long. To bring it down to or a Green Island or Orange Bay. To, to bring it to, to, no, to Negril. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's, it's not asking for the moon. It's not, while we wait until the plant's been fixed up in Roaring River, which is going to take four years. We cannot wait four years for water. There are, if you go down to the planning authority, there are several plans in that office for people who want to um, expand. Mm. I mean, I know we are only a small bit, but we have got a plan that, and I don't even feel like going and take it to the planning office because what am I going to even use to build mm. the, concert, the, the building? And there are thousands of uh, small units between hotel rooms and residential that are in the planning stage for this area. So we, we can't just look at how much water we need to satisfy our demand today. We have to look at how much water we are going to need to satisfy our demand for another 25, 30 years. And have, have we heard anything along those lines about 
thinking that far into the future and implementing and investing in infrastructure in that nature? We can't even have a discussion on what we need for today. No, unfortunately, and this this is somehow, it baffles me that people who are undoubtedly very intelligent, bright people, can sit in an office and not be thinking, this is your responsibility, this is what you're getting paid for. How can you sit there and not make any effort to deal with these problems that none of them are fools they're all intelligent people mm. so why are they not doing it they don't care i don't know maybe they're just short-sighted looking to the next election i was going to bring that up in terms of um i was privy to a discussion some weeks ago where um a person from a particular political party indicated that, oh, um, a lot of things aren't going to happen under this labor government because, you know, the person who, say, controls water is a PNP affiliate, and then the person who controls roads is a, you know, is a PNP affiliate. And the thing that baffled me was that that person was not listening to the words that was coming out of his mouth. And what I mean... And what I mean by this is that I would want, after an election is held and, you know, the votes are in, you know, you're a part of this party, I'm a part of that party. At the end of the day, you know, when that particular party is in power, we all go back to being Jamaicans where we work together. Whether you're a PNP, whether you're a JLP, we need to work together because we are all Jamaicans at the end of the day. We're all human beings at the end of the day. And we want to live in better conditions. We want to drive on better roads. And I feel that a lot of the person, like the officials in Kingston, if it's not affecting them, they don't really care. Mm -hmm. And this is where I'm glad you've used your platform to have this discussion. And this is a discussion I want more persons in the community to be having so we can all come together and just ask them in a nice way. You know, I'm not saying to demand it, but ask them, how can we help you to give us the better roads? How can we help you to give us the water? You know, that's a mindset I'm encouraging persons to have. No, oh, great point. And yeah, that is a ridiculous conversation and dialogue to be a part of. And to have like a mindset of that nature that because, you know, your boy or whatever is not the one doing this and you're gonna you know almost sabotage the right. situation because it doesn't it doesn't align with your political affiliation just like that's not what this is about exactly it should never be and it's just like we're we're always jamaicans you know and yep. we're always here should be here to help each other out and right. really uplift each other more than anything else and uh but i know that that is a mindset of a lot of people you know and you're absolutely right. We do need to kind of, I kind of, we need to immediately get out of that mindset because I don't know what the cause or the reason is for this situation right now. But at the end of the day, it's like there's a community that doesn't have water. There right. There are so many individuals that don't have water. We don't have the answers to it. I know we're in a drought, but nobody's communicating with us. That's true. And I think that's just the basic thing that we can we can ask for and we can expect is just somebody to say, hey, what's going on? Or just tell us like, Look, you're not going to have water for six weeks. Or whatever it is. But we have no idea. We have no idea. Not a clue. You know, one of my views on it, why we are where we are, this area, Westmoreland, for whatever reason, uh, you have different area in Jamaica has got very strong political leanings. Mm -hmm. So, when one side is in, and that side know they have very strong political leaning. We don't have to spend much money. We don't have to do anything. We've got that them covered. When the other side is in power, it says, oh boy, we won't waste our time with them down here because it doesn't matter what we do, we are not going to win. And this is unfortunate, but that's, I feel that could be the only reason why we, with such great potential, are always being forgotten. It doesn't matter which side is in. We are forgotten. Thank you. 
It's like we don't care, we don't count. We are not important. As I said, it's the only time. It's the end of the tax year is starting, I think, in a few days. That's the only time we will be remembered to go and pay our land taxes. Apart from that. Yeah, and I, and I want, you know, for the people out there who are watching, like I, I want them to understand that it's a multitude of what you're alluding to, like it's a multitude of situations, issues that have just continuously never been resolved or addressed. And this is just another thing to be put on top of it. Uh, can go through it. I'm sure you guys can add to it. Uh, the food and vegetable market, the mm. garbage situation, yes. the Negril Beach Park that has been there for how long? Unfinished, just a, a dilapidated situation. The finishing of the shared user path across the street, the godforsaken potholes, the half a road that we have on the west end. And I know it sounds like I'm complaining and complaining, but like, this it's is true, stuff that has you been have the right to for years. But it's for years. It's not right. something that happened yesterday. Exactly. You know, it's like something that we've been asking for, for years. to be addressed. For years, some of this stuff going on for more than 10 years. Yeah. And it just doesn't seem like anybody is listening to us at all. You know, one of the most cruel things, I think, my good friend Ray Arthur is 83 years old. He went to school at the Negril um, All Aid School around there. Any improvement that has been done to that school, it's by private citizens whether the Chamber or the Ruckos Foundation, putting dirt on the ground so the kids wouldn't be falling down, cutting up themselves, putting in flush toilet when there was a pit toilet, the chamber, everything. Years ago, when Mr. Whiteman was Minister of Education, we brought him down here. Funny enough, it was a weekend because there is a plot of land just across from best choice, the hardware property there, that was earmarked for a modern school. So you can just imagine how long, where that school is, it's the most dangerous mm. place, right? One of our members at the time, we told Mr. Whiteman, was prepared to buy that plot of land and would wait until the new school was completed before he would take possession of the land. He was offering then the going market value. That, I mean, this must be over 20 years. Look how we have grown and we haven't got a proper school. Negril should have not just a modern primary school, but we need a technical high school. People have to leave from here, send their kids all the way to Savlama. That's about a thousand dollar a day. It's costing parents to send their kids to school. Right? How can we not have a proper schooling for our kids and expect a future? Who's going to come and help us? To upgrade our properties. How are we going to compete with other countries if we are not having quality students coming so we can train? If we are not having enough educated kids coming out of school in these modern times? When, I mean, working in a hotel is not just somebody stand up handing out plate and whatever. You need engineers, you need technicians, you need all different skill. So therefore, we must have these kids coming out of school so you alone cannot make your business successful and progress. You need help. And yet, a thing as education, they haven't paid us no mind and talk about progress. And I, I touch on two things with that. like. I always said I couldn't imagine where Negril would be and the children of Negril would be without the Rock House Foundation, without the Rotary Club of Negril, without uh, St. Anthony's Soup Kitchen, Mary Gate of Heaven mm -hmm. Church, um, the yeah. Sandals Foundation, the Negril Education Environment Trust, like all the, the Qantas Club, 
like all these private organizations mm -hmm. that collect and donations from all over the world from people who love Jamaica and want to see Jamaica do well, particularly the, particularly the kids. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it, it, I don't think people understand how much these organizations do for Negro and do for the kids and the impact that it has. And it's really filling the gap that should be coming from public funds. Mm -hmm. And like, that's one thing that I don't get about the economics of, 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 of the allocation of funds in Jamaica is like the, the percentage that's going towards education is crazy. It's, just, it's, it's nothing. And you, like you rightfully said, the expectation for us to be competing on a global level, mm -hmm. when you look at the inputs that we have, how can you expect us and our children that are eventually going to become adults to, to be competing globally? Like we can't, we can't. I mean, if, if we can't get them to school. Exactly. And we can't get them an education. Like, what do we expect? What do we expect? And I think we, you know, if we don't kind of nip this stuff in the bud in a decade or two from now, we're going to really be fall behind. And I think we're falling behind now. We are like, behind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, one of the important things, if we are all honest, this last winter season, almost every one of us, almost every one of us, could have employed, have a have position that weren't filled, mm. right? Mm. Why? Because we couldn't get the persons with the skill, the qualified person. We all could employ more people, yeah. but we just couldn't find that skill to come. And because we, as a country, we did not invest enough and... When you find someone, most of the time, it's some far off, maybe Kingston, there is the accommodation problem, right? Because they don't, they're not here with families and relative, and accommodation is scarce in the grill and expensive. So we need, the same way we need the sewage, we need the water, we need the schools we need everything that will make us competitive and these are most of the things that we cannot provide for ourselves it's the responsibility of the state so the state is letting us down preventing us from being competitive preventing us from being our best and uh, I know my mic, they keep saying my mic is cutting in and I hope this is a little better. But um, you hit on a good point in regards to the us having a great winter season uh, mm -hmm. that we just, just, just coming out of. But the challenge of finding workers, it's, it was, it's crazy. Even now up until this day, and I was just having this discussion with my friend who's, uh, he's building a villa on the West End. And he's also having the same problem to get contract workers, electricians, um, carpenters, mm -hmm. uh, so much. So he's, he's getting them to come in from Kingston mm -hmm. and we don't, and I believe the prime minister made a speech recently, uh, about the, he understands that we have a skilled labor shortage, um, and then implementing certain things, but it's really an emergency situation where, and mm -hmm. we got to think that this is not something that happened today. It's because of these reasons when we look further upstream that decisions or lack there of decisions that were made 10 or 15 years ago is as to why we don't have the labor that we have now. And if we are continue on the same path, we're just going to extrapolate what's already been occurring and it's just going to get worse and worse. We have actually have, uh, um, speaking of that specifically, um, the chamber is working on trying to develop a piece of land that we have to create a skills training center, to be able to train people in 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 practical building skills, because as as the government keeps talking about expansion and expansion, there's a lot of building going on, and more and more of that will be happening. And the opportunity, and there's great job opportunities for for young people to be able to and learning a skill or a trade. As as I'm a tradesperson myself, and and uh, you know, I just think that there's there's something very is also very gratifying about doing something like that when you're actually making something physically. One thing to sit in front of a computer and type out letters and things like that, which we all spend plenty of time doing. But I find 
I find it very rewarding to actually make to build something to make something to that something you can stand back and 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 see it's a very simple practical thing that you can you know you've actually managed to actually physically <laughs> manifest something anyway sorry I go down go down that path but but the idea that we we create um a training center here in Negril to be able to supply people to the building and construction industry here in Negril and so we're working on trying to develop that at the moment actually no oh, that's amazing and, and that's like very much needed. Uh, the, the electrician that we use here at Travelers, uh, he was telling me like the thing is like he, I mean, he's probably in his late seventies. I want to say, I'm not yeah, really, he, but he's great. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go with mid seventies. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this McKenzie's gonna kill me. Um, but he's amazing, fantastic at what he does. And I'm like, you don't have somebody coming up under you, and. Um, He's like, nope, they don't want to work and he can't find somebody, no apprentice. And I'm like, who is he going to be able to pass on this knowledge to? Mm. You know, and it's just, and is it going to die with him? And he said the same thing. He's willing to train somebody and he just can't, he just can't find them. They'll, they'll come work for a week or two and they're gone. So I think that that skills training center is just so important. It's just so needed, especially for young people coming into these, these industries. But there again, the reason why we are doing it, are looking about doing it, it's not because we think that's something we should go out and do. It's because of the vacuum that exists when the state fail to take these things into, take up these things. We realize nobody else is doing it. So he says, like hell, we have to step outside of our regular business to go and do something really which we shouldn't be doing but we realize we have to do it for our survival sake and this is where it makes you angry right it makes you angry because our competitors in other parts of the world they don't have to do it they just sit down and get along with their business we have to do our business, we have to compete, and we have to take up some of the government responsibility. And that's the sad thing. Oh, that's what, yeah, that's a great point. Um, I on my podcast, I'm always comparing us to uh to, to Tulum specifically, Negril. Like a lot of people mm -hmm. do that comparison. Negril, Tulum, Negril could be the next Tulum. Yeah, I, I don't think those hotels are worried about and uh, fighting with the government about getting water into their pipes are uh, worried about getting their children to school. No. And that's a, and it's just like another thing that we have to take on as a community trying to compete uh, on a, on a global level and just not getting those basic things taken care of. And another thing that people take, do not take into consideration the amount of social, work that we take up the social responsibility yeah. right because there is no other social program around apart from what comes from the workplace in other words when like things like health right i mean when your staff is sick it's your responsibility technically here in the grill whether you provide insurance for them or you assist in forking out the money to, to, to pay for them. Mm. So we are a wholly more than just a business. Mm. We are in a way somehow operate like a, some social establishment mm. because of the luck there is. There is a vacuum. And we unwillingly, or, and I wouldn't say unwillingly, but not, it wasn't part of our plan to do it, but we wind up in it. But I also say, like, not just physical health, but I also even say in the mental health. Mm -hmm. And we end up filling that gap because there are a lot of domestic challenges that many of our team members face, and it ends up, I wouldn't necessarily say coming to work, but it work kind of becomes that that couch that you sit down and you talk, you vent, and you figure out things and you you hear the problems and challenges of, of some of 
and some of it is crazy. Some of it is crazy. And that is like, like you're saying, like the programs that are in place in other parts of the world or maybe even other parts of this country, we don't have the access to that. No. And we become we become the psychologists. Very much so. In a big way. Um, I do wanna I wanna take a, a little break before we move in the second half. We got Sophie Grizzle here, and there's we wanna dive more into the morass fire integrating Iwiko into this, and then also talk about the um the garbage situation that we're, we're facing here as well. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take a quick break and about five minutes or so, and we'll be right back. All right, we're going to go on a little swimmy swim. I think I might try to get to the reef over there. It's like uh, maybe 400 meters out or so. Haven't done that in a while. Might give that a go, but it's going to be a relaxed one today. These are mornings in the grill. Let's do it. I'm so much faster than me <sighs> couldn't catch him I think he likes those little jellyfish things I don't know what they are but I don't like swimming in them <clears throat> I think the turtle likes to eat them I think they like little jellyfish thingies I don't know <sighs> not too far back too far out the reef is over here somewhere we're close <clears throat> Morning, Billy. that little break that little swim break if you will next up we got some drone shots from a sunset i think like two days ago or so so a few more minutes then we'll get back to the program here enjoy
Right. And we are back from our break. Thank you guys for hanging out with us here. And for those just joining, we are having a discussion on some of the unprecedented challenges that we are facing here in our Negril community. And we have joined with us now Sophie Grizzle, who is uh, the owner of Shirella Inn and also is a member of the Negril Chamber of Commerce, joining the discussion. And we want to hop back to the morass situation. And as you can tell from the thumbnail, it was a very serious, serious situation that we were facing uh, last week and the week before. Ash everywhere, burning like crazy. And there has actually been a solution and resources put forward to help address this from happening. And that is through the IWECO project. And we have Sophie joining us here to. Tell us a little bit more about that project and what IWECO is and all of that. So welcome, Sophie. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, well, I just want to give a little bit of history. This, um, the funds were awarded in 2017. It was supposed to be a four-year project. Um, Where did the funds come from, Sophie? Oh, sorry. That came from, well, first... the United Nations Development right. um, Program. program. It was uh, 3.114 million US dollars. And the government of Jamaica was going to put in just under half a million US dollars. Uh, this project has been, the inception has been many years ago, and it was started through the chamber. Then it went through NEPT, Negro Environmental Protection Trust. And then NEPA took it over, and eventually we got the funding for it. We were all very excited about it. And a lot of the, the more elderly people in the community were like, oh, it's never going to happen. And us on the project steering committee, which was myself and Damien and Nola Stair, we we're all very, okay, we're going to prove them wrong. We're going to, this project is going to work. It's going to be successful. And we we're all very excited. We spent a lot of time on this project. And so eventually, because of COVID, there was delays, obviously, and so forth. But eventually, 
we finally got the hydrologist report, which is the most important part of this rewetting exercise, because it shows us the way on, on the different methods that can be done. So there were basically five methods that are, were put forward, and all of them can be integrated together, which means you can start with one or two, or hopefully the four of them at once. Now, the first um, proposal was to build what they call bonds, which are little earthen works, and that this would have to be done in the middle of the morass. And the problem with this um, specific solution is that it's inaccessible to humans. So in order to get there to actually build these bonds, you would have to buy special equipment, special tractors that can go over wetlands, which are very expensive. And also these bonds would need to be maintained. The other negative about this solution is it's the most expensive solution. <laughs> and also the reports are showing that the rainfall in Negril has decreased over the, over the last 10, 15 years. So these bonds would be there to retain the rainwater, but if we're getting less and less, it would have less water to retain. The second option- Sorry, I just wanna be clear on, on the bonds and what they do. So there are these, I'm imagining these contraptments that are put in the middle of the morass. Yes, they're like little earthenworks, like okay. little, little earthen walls, if I should put it that way. I don't know what that is, earthen wall. It's made of earth, and okay. it's like a little mound. Okay, that's what they call. That's what they look like. And they have water in. They hold the water. They would hold the water in, okay. right? Because it's the, the, really about trying to trying to direct the water to to a, a dry area, so to speak. So you would sort of almost like like a dike in a way, in a way that it would would direct the water to an area where you want it to go. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So I'm that. okay. Um, the next option was to block the East Canal which would make the water flow over into the morass. Um, that's a fairly cheap option as well and very doable. The only issue, the only neg well, it's not really a negative, but eventually the water would flow over, go around it and flow back into the canal on, on the other side. But it was, it's still a positive solution. And if it's done with the other solutions, it's still a very good idea. Um, Third option was to build little mini bonds around where the whistling ducks are, the Royal Palm Reserve, which would help to keep more water in the pond and make a bigger area for the whistling ducks' um, habitat because they're becoming very endangered. And then the fourth option, which I believe and the experts believe, and also uh, Dr. Edward Maltby, who is the world renowned expert on wetlands has agreed is initially the morass was fed by seven natural springs that fed directly into the morass and maintained the moisture in the morass. Now when the canal was built it cut off all seven of these um, springs and the suggestion has been is that we bring back not even all seven of them but a portion, maybe three or four. It is one of the cheapest ways. There's two ways we could do it. We could build um, like little mini tanks to collect the water and then through pipes, take it over the canal and into the morass. And the other option is because some of the farmers use these um, springs is to take the water at the end of its journey and then take it over. But that, might be a little bit more difficult because there'll be less um, the height, the, the the pressure to take it over, because the, the they would take the water from the springs at the top, so you'd have the pressure to feed it directly. That solution will actually cover up to eighty percent of the morass, so it's the cheapest solution, it's the easiest solution, and it could be done by national resources water or it could be done by nwc and it's something that could be done it could be started and we could start to see the benefits of it very very quickly so that's where we are with the solutions now we have been told by nepa recently that they're going to start the project using the nwa national works agency 
to design the project, what they're going to do, which is to build these, what we call bonds or the earthen works, which is very costly and will only affect a very small area. And as we can see through your photos, the fire rages from right through the morass from north to south. This was only in the northern section. So the, ex, the sections to the south, which is where the town of Negril is and all the smaller properties, it would not benefit from that. It would just be the northern section that would benefit from that. So, so why are they doing that or deciding to do that? That's a question we're all asking. Um, we're feeling that NEPA wants to use these funds to, to, to spend it with, I don't know, their contractors. I, I, I really don't know. These, these are the issues we're, we're not too sure about. But it, it is from what you're, the way you've explained it, it doesn't make much logical sense to do that, to choose that option. No, no. And we've been trying to talk to the minister. I, we went to a meeting and I brought it up with Minister Samuda and there was no, you know, no positive response. Um, we've invited him to Nigril to come and speak to us and we've not had a positive response either. So. We don't know where we are, but this, this project is supposed to finish on the thirty first on the thirtieth of June, and of this year of this year, and because it's been extended three or four times now, and I think this is the final extension. It was extended until December this last year, and then we got to understand in January after repeatedly asking what's happening, we finally got a letter from NEPA saying it's been extended until June. But they're talking about the design phase. So I really feel that maybe we're paying all this money to do the design and nothing physical is actually going to get done. I, I have a strange feeling this is what's going to be the problem. And so, uh, like you said, this is from 2017. This was approved from the United Nations. Yes. And when you say the deadline is in June, like have the, have the funds from the United Nations already been given to us here in Jamaica or is it like a slow release it's 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 a slow release depending on is it called fiscal space mm. that was one of the big problems throughout the whole project it, there was always a problem with the fiscal space um I don't think UNEP is giving funds until a certain amount of work is done they've already given a lot of funding because you know there's been a lot of reports done for this that really didn't impact so much this project, but there were lots of extras, I call them. I mean, some of them were very good. Um, some of them, I, we felt that they weren't very necessary. Um, one of the part of the project was the Royal Palm Reserve, which we think is a very, very important training and learning tool, and also a visitor, visitor attraction. And that, there was some good reports on that. Um, they did a seagrass uh, report on, you know, how the quality of the seagrass, which was which was an interesting report. Um, but they did a lot of reports that didn't really impact positively the project, the, the core of that project, which is the rewetting of the morass. And now there was, um, I don't know, if, I can't, I'm maybe mixing up our offline conversation with our online conversation. Um, how much funds were allocated for this project? and um, do you, we know how much was put in or paid out to do the research and the design aspect? Okay, so it was 3.114 million was given from UNEP to do the project. Um, some of the funding has been spent. I have no idea how much is left. I think the funding for the actual re-wetting part of it was, was it 700,000 US, I think. No, it was nothing. It was like a hundred thousand. Oh, it was a hundred thousand. I can't remember. It was like exactly. a, a very small amount of the money was actually allocated to for the actual re-retting. I wonder if it's actually in here. I seem to remember that. That's, that seems off. Yes. <laughs> well, we, the we, the amount, to be honest, the amount of research and re, re, reports and 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 feasibility studies and 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 um, you know. Uh, development plans and all of these sort of things that were done. And, you know, both Sophie and I have been to, to most of these meetings and 
just the the I've got on my computer. There's like there's like oh, there must be thirty reports yeah. that I that I have that, and some of them are very detailed and and inclusive. And uh, so <clears throat> a lot of the money has gone to do these reports, it's all w- without actually anything actually physically happening. As I said earlier, I'm a very practical person, and so the idea that you actually get something done for it rather than Yes, I, and a lot of the reports are actually very good and, they, and there's a lot of information in them. The LIDAR report was very good. They did a really, uh, a, a really good um, uh, version of that. And, but, but it just, you know, the idea that still nothing has actually happened. Yeah, we, action, action, yeah. action. And I guess what's the gap between the reports and the actual physical rewetting of the morass? Well, I think the gap is very big. And I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, I don't think this is public knowledge, but uh, UNEP didn't actually open up an investigation into NEPA because they felt that there was too much reports and there was no physical action. Um, UNEP had actually asked that there be an office here in, in Negril, and NEPA said no, the office has to be in Kingston. Um, they outfitted new offices just for this project. Um, so there's been a disgruntlement from the very beginning on how NEPA has handled this. And I think this is the largest project I believe that NEPA has ever taken on. And I just feel that they weren't prepared. I, I know COVID is a big excuse. Um, I'm not saying some of it isn't valid and relevant, but I think... Um, they don't really have a good track record of completing projects like this. And I think this one was very challenging for them. But I think we need to get practical. As Damien says, we need to just get it done. And I mean, just taking a a couple of the springs, even three, and putting the water over, that's something they could organize and do by the next two months. It's not something that takes, you know, a year to organize and complete. The one thing I would ask, while NEPA is the body responsible for this, this comes under the Minister of Environment, whose office is in the Prime Minister's office. And shouldn't they have some oversight as to what is being done? And Can you just leave it up to NEPA, such an important... um, uh, project and what is the minister doing? Where is he? Is he is he not um, concerned? Is he not um, worried about the thing being finished under his watch? Where is his pride? I think one of the problems with both the minister and the prime minister is that Nepal is looked on as the experts in this field, the technical people. And they tend to want to listen to who they feel are the experts. Um, we're not experts down here, but thankfully we do have an expert on our team, and that's Dr. Edward Maltby. And, you know, he's worked with us. We've worked with JET, Jamaica Environmental Trust. And, you know, every one of them I've spoken to who are more cognizant. But I don't think you need to be an expert to understand that doing it the natural way. Naturally, there were seven springs feeding the morass so why not just reinstitute a couple of them it's it's not scientific it's not you know that difficult to do it's you, know, you weren't here before when we were earlier when we were having the discussion but it there seems to be a sentiment that we are being forgotten here in the grill like in in major major ways and you just explaining us the to us the logistics of all the ins and outs of this bureaucracy it's just another example of like, man, you have to wonder, like, do they care, you know, and do they care that we are the ones suffering because of the lack of action? Do they care that we are the ones who are inherently going to suffer the consequences, which could be very bad, very detrimental to all of our well-beings? Mm-hmm. And we're the ones who are going to suffer from it. And this is like, please listen to us. Please take what we are saying very seriously. And we want what is best for us. And we have no other dog in the fight other than preserving our environment and making sure that it is here and exists 
not only for us, but for future generations. And that should be taken into high consideration. But it's, it's I mean, it was mentioned earlier, we depend on the vi environment for economic reasons. And uh, Dr. Maltby pointed out to us that in Indonesia a couple of years ago, these fires, they've just been surface fires so far. And he said, thankfully, that's great because if ever it gets dry enough for it to go down into the peat, it can go down six meters. The peat is six meters down. And if ever that starts to burn, it can burn for an entire year. Can you imagine? You won't see the flames. You just have the smoke. In Indonesia, it closed down the airport for two months. The, the economic disaster it was in Indonesia, can we afford that in Jamaica? And so I'm hoping that somewhere along the line, the Minister of, um, sorry, <laughs> Dr. Clark, Minister of Finance, hears this because it will affect Jamaica financially. We supply a third of the tourism taxes into Jamaica. So the minister and the prime minister needs to understand we're not, we're not just a bunch of tree huggers down here trying to save a couple of trees. We're here trying to save the economic value of Negril to the nation, not just to Negrillians. It affects the entire nation if this happens. Can you imagine fires in the morass six, for six months of the year? We would all go out of business. And at the end of the day, it will not just be the Negril people who suffer from this. It will be the entire nation. So I think we need to... Even if the, you're not an environmentalist, you un have to understand that this affects the economic viability of Negro. And these are the very reasons why I think the, both the Minister of Environment and the Prime Minister in whose office it resides has got to be drawn up and to be made aware of the danger because it's on their watch that all of this is happening. And how do we look? What, what happens if next couple of years we go back to these international body for fun when we have a, 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 a reputation of not fully using the funds that we have been given? It's our, as a country, reputation is at stake as well for any future project that we may approach them for. So I don't think this is something that um, even the Prime Minister and the Minister of Environment can just sit back and leave it up to NEPA. I was going to say, maybe they don't understand the magnitude of this project and the implications that it could possibly have on the country's reputation, like you're saying, and then also on essentially the existence of Negril as a tourism destination. Well, that's what I said before. It is so important that we have a meeting directly with our Prime Minister and our Minister of Finance to bring about these very, very important issues. Because basically, this is not just a cosmetic kind of problem we have. This is a survival problem that we have. We are struggling for our existence. And therefore, we can't afford to be dilly-dallying with any lower um, parties. We have to go to the top. We have spent years with all these lower branches to achieve nothing. So I don't see we have any other option than to sit down with the Prime Minister, Minister of Finance, and Deputy Prime Minister. No, we, you're, you're right. And I, I, I think we are at that level. I think we're beyond that level. You know, uh, we, we, we really do need to sit down with them as a community and know that they understand to the fullest extent that was ex just explained about what we are on track to do and why we are on track to have happen to our community if we don't do something about it. Well, hopefully we will get a reply from the Prime Minister's office soon because, yes, we realize that it was an extremely busy time for him. 
there was the local government, and then there was the whole budget and budget presentation. All that is behind him. And I think pretty soon we will um, we will have got some answers regarding our meeting with the Prime Minister. I hope so. I mean, that would be something that would be good to happen really soon. Cause as quickly as possible. This doesn't seem like this. I mean, I think it's something we would like to have within the next couple of weeks. Because I think it doesn't matter what we have in hand, we'll drop it and be there. Right. And all he has to give us is just maybe a hour of his time. So we'll, we'll go there, his office. Yeah, yeah. Now, yes. I mean, it's important enough for us to give up a day and go and see him. It's, it is. There is nothing more important. Yeah. Kind of almost nothing else really matters if this isn't taken care of. Exactly. Yeah, to build all these hotels and homes and everything, but... But, you know, uh, as far as Dr. Malby explained to us, we weren't even able to live here. Wow. Yeah. People had to be evacuated over in Indonesia where this thing happens. I mean, look at California much closer mm -hmm. i mean those fires are i mean i feel so bad for those people but yeah. if you're saying that that could be the possibility and possible reality that we'd live in that like let's do something about it now like mm -hmm. yes. like we know this is coming we know this is going to happen and not only we know something can be done about it it's not that you know it's gonna happen and lord put our hands up we can't do anything we can do something it's just that people, I can't understand how you can have an entity like NEPA, who is not much more involved in this. Not, I can't see why they haven't got an office in the grill while this project is going on. How can you be four hours away from it? And you said this is the biggest project that they've ever done? Yeah. Yeah. And the project managers in Kingston? You know, they had a girl, there was a girl down here who was very good, who tried very hard to try and keep, keep. and the other thing about it too is that we've found down here is, is just a lack of communication. Back to that again, that all these things are happening in Kingston and we don't even know about what's going on in our backyard or it's, it's actually not going on in our backyard, you know. <laughs> um, you know, uh, 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 and, and just the lack of communication. It's like, it's almost, it's almost like at times Sophie and I have talked about this and it almost seems disrespectful. You know, we're, we've been on this steering committee. We were put on the steering committee for the iWeco project from the day one, from day one. And it seems that all this stuff was going on and we didn't even know about it. And then even when the, the project sort of closed down, so to speak, we didn't even know. We're asking what's we're asking, we've been asking and asking and asking, writing letters to them saying, could we please have an update on what's happening with this and where are we with that and certain things that are dates passing that are supposed to be, you know, end dates or, you know, and then, and then and now we find, oh, we just extended it. Oh, we just extended it. Oh, we just extended it. And that's, and so in a way, they're really not giving us any information at all. They're just telling us that they've extended it. And you're literally on the committee. We're on the steering committee for that, for that project. Yeah. But I really do believe that I think UNEP has might have cut some of the funding, and I think that's why they're turning it down um, because they did investigate. We never heard the results of the investigation. Um, I think it would be interesting if we could find out what really happened. But um, I feel that this has really put on stall, you know, further projects. And there's a lot of projects that we need to help us be more climate resilient as a nation. Mm. And, and this is the main source of funding for Jamaica for climate resilience. And so I think if we, we've shown that we're unable to do a project like this, then I think it's not very good for our reputation. Is there any way that, that we could find out the results of the investigation from UNEP directly? Um, where we've asked the local, and she keeps referring us back to, to NEPA and the project manager, who has not been answering us. Uh, I think the last answer was from somebody else in NEPA who, who responded to us after two or three emails. 
So it, it's disappointing. The communication, as, as Damien says, it, it, it's very disappointing. Or all of a sudden they'll send you an email, we're having a meeting tomorrow in Kingston, you're invited. Um, so there's a lack of respect, a, a big lack of respect. But, you know, we want the project to succeed. I think at the end of the day, I think we're prepared to do anything to help whichever way we can to make this project succeed. Because I really would not like the elderly in the community who poo-pooed us at the beginning to actually be proven right. I think it's time we get positive things done. And I think it can be done. It can still be done. The funding is there. It can still be done to do just do some of the cheaper options to start with. And then further down the line, we can do the more expensive options. But, you know, I still go back to this, that every project needs someone or some entity to drive it. In this case, whoever is the minister of the environment certainly has more power or have more say than the president or chairman of NEPA. And if you are the minister and this entity under you isn't performing, or don't you go and find out what's the matter? What's the problem? Is this something the government needs to help you to get it done? I find it's laziness. It's a kind of don't care attitude, right? And just come and give us nice word. And the only thing he comes to rally about is another series of breakwater throwing stones in the sea, right? You know, the minister, he, he needs shaking up. Jesus Christ, if he was employed for a private company and he, under his watch, I mean, look, the guy in um, what's this air company in the state, Boeing, Boeing. see the, the guy out. Who's responsible for production? Right? Mm -hmm. It's the same. There is this guy who's the minister. Something as important as this. He knows about it. And he kind of, mm. Nepa, you know, it's not good enough. It is not good enough. And therefore, we have to go over his head now to his boss, who is the prime minister, because he has failed us. And there's no other way to look at it. He's a nice man, da da da, but he has failed us. So, what can we do as uh, as a community, as the Throck community, as the people who are watching this um, and probably hearing about the ins and outs of what is going on for the first time and getting a real understanding of why things have not been moving forward with the project and how dire this situation is? Is there anybody that we can call, that we can email? I think the only thing I think you can do, and thanks for the offer, is to call our minister who's responsible and let him tell you why. This is the Minister of the Environment? Yes. Okay. He is the man, apart from the Prime Minister, he is the man who can go walk into NEPT and demand action. NEPA. NEPA. NEPA and demand action, right? he is superior to them. So and it's under his watch, his portfolio, he's responsible. So if your guys, your people can call him and say, listen, we hear about this. First, is it true? And if it is true, what are you doing about it? You need to do something. If you want to help us out, do exactly that. You know, uh, call the, the minister's office, email them, find out directly from them or his office what's going on. Why is this the way it is? Or is it the way that it is that we've explained it? Don't take it for our word, yeah. as Mr. Grizzle says. And see if they can explain to you because we're not getting any answers over here. And that would, I think that would really, really help us out. And here on the ground, of course, we're going to advocate for that, for that meeting with the prime minister. Yes. Um, Winthrop, can I just say that if anybody is interested in finding out more information about the IWECA project, if they go on the Negro Chamber of Commerce website under projects, 
they'll see a lot of the um, the reports and consultancies. So anybody who interest, who's interested in more information, they can see. And the hydrologist report is also on there as well. And the seagrass report. So they're, they're very interesting projects for anybody who wants further information or even students who are doing work and want to know more about the morass. Um, I think it's everything is i think most of the things are there for them to, to access and that's on uh what's the website in the grill chamber of yeah okay the grill chamber of commerce oh. dot org dot org dot org sorry, sorry yes. chamber <laughs> .com dot org you can check it's it out more advanced than that <laughs> okay um so with that as 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 i was saying before about uh another subject that we want to talk about is the garbage situation that we're we're facing yes. here in the grill and to start with, I can I'll I'll give an example or experience that I had a few days ago with a guest here, Travelers, and she's a repeat guest. Um, she's actually a subscriber, so she might be watching this and and came down and stayed with us here, at Travelers, and her complaint was just how dirty the grill is, and it's just it really is filthy. Unfortunately, um, that's just the reality, and. She just can't understand why it is like this. Why can't the town be cleaned up? Why can't the garbage be removed? And she asked me for all of these contact information. So you're, you're probably going to get a letter from her, from the, the Girl Chamber of Commerce, GHCA, like all these different entities. She wants to write a letter um, because she can't believe it. And she's, uh, she's Jamaican born, living abroad, is considering moving back and retiring here. And that is her perspective and that is her experience and i didn't really have any answers for her i mean part of the issue really with the garbage to explain to people who might not understand you know we're at the very western tip of jamaica and our garbage situation the garbage trucks that come and ply the roads down here to, to pick up garbage all come from montego bay every day they drive all the way down the road um, and obviously then at some stage they're going to be full and then they have to drive back up the road, you know. And so it's very, it's, you know, it's an hour and a half drive each way on a good day, you know. And uh, obviously there's a lot of wear and tear on those trucks, that everything from fuel to tyres to, you know, oil and, and the maintenance of those trucks. And so there's a part of the problem is that often the trucks are broken down. Um, all, of course, all uh, uh, commercial entities have to have a contract with at least one garbage collector so that it doesn't put so the, the theory is that it doesn't put the um the 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 the, 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 the Nash, uh, nswma the national body uh, uh, the national solid waste management agency who run the the public garbage the theory is is that the private contractors do all the contractors to do all the the the, the commercial thanks sophie the commercial garbage, so so that theoretically to leave the NSWMA to be able to pick up the, the public garbage. But the NSWMA is also a private contractor. And so their priority, quite understandably, is to pick up the garbage that they're being paid to pick up rather than picking up the public garbage, which they're not being paid. Well, they're being, that's what they're there for. Yeah. But... Uh, their priority usually is to try. They now they say that they're doing a two tier system now, and that they've changed all of that. And but there's constantly it's almost like it's a conflict of interest. Yeah. Is that's what that's really the simplest way to say it. And so it seems that it seems crazy that that that. And and then you complain that they're not picking up the garbage. Well, duh. It's not understand. It's uh, totally understandable why they're not. Yeah, the incentive is it's, it's on the wrong side. Yeah, it's on the wrong. You see, and this again, it's something that should be easily addressed. You have a lot of residential area. Mm -hmm. right? You don't have someone who come and organize and says, and, and Monday, we will be over Whitehall, and Tuesday, we will be here, and then when, you know, an organized day. They so, do actually have a schedule. There is actually a schedule and for paper. NSWMA. And on paper, yeah, yes, exactly. Paper, right? <laughs> because there is no one physically on the ground here to see to it that what's on the paper is actually being carried out. Right? And therefore, someone lives 
somewhere in one of these residential areas, has the stinking garbage in their house. So they bag it up and they come and drop it on the boulevard because the truck passes along and occasionally it's been taken up. So you're encouraged your boulevard, your main tourist drive, to be a garbage collection area. The dogs tear it up. Rodents, cats. It's a restaurant for everybody, right? Now, it's not so difficult. Some time ago when we complained, they says, oh, we're going to take care of your problem. We're going to have a truck just from the door. And the truck did come. But with the truck come, come their agent to solicit commercial business, as Damien says, for the truck. So it's only natural that they do it. Now, this boulevard, as you notice, it's been named of one of our national heroes, Norman Washington Manley. And yet, it, you use a, a boulevard that has been named after your national era as a garbage collection area. This says there are people with no pride. But it's a reflection on all of us as Jamaicans. Just as the guest says to him, how come the place is so garbage? You know, we have quite a lot of European guests. And... They book in tomorrow morning. Where is the town center? We want to go. And it's nice for them to go. That's how they spend money. That's how people go. In less than half an hour, they're back. And to be quite frank, I try to avoid them when they come back. Because I know exactly what they're going to say. I'm going to say, oh, you're back early. Oh, yes, Jesus. Why is your town so filthy? No. Can you imagine how, how small do you feel when somebody look at you and says that? Why oh, your tone is so filthy? And because it's filthy, they don't hang about. They don't hang about. Small people doesn't get to make any money. So you build frustration. right? And when people walk out, they spend money. They buy things sometimes they don't even need, right? When you come and sit on the beach, we don't particularly want you to sit on our beach all day. We want you to go out. We want you to go and spend money. And the one thing, it's not the hustlers that preventing people from coming out at the moment. No, the hustlers have learned their lesson. They are very... They're a lot better than they used I to be. Trust me, I agree. Totally. Right? Yeah. totally. What keeping the tourists out is the filth, which is the easiest one. And it's about time the director, uh, Mr. Jones or whoever, comes to Negril and organize a proper system for collecting the garbage. You can't blame the people in their homes for bringing the garbage out. I mean, I would do the same if it's there stinking up the place. We have appealed to them not to burn it. They stop burning it, so they carry it and put it on the road. So again, what we suffer from is not a lack of equipment. It's not a lack of money. It's a lack of accountability, and it's a lack of management. That's where our problem is. People get paid for a job, and they do not perform. The, one of the um, suggestions, and this has been going on for, for a long time, is that there's a halfway station. Um, a site has been proposed um, is it near to, on Froom, the way Froom. near to Froome, yes, which would um, reduce the time to about half an hour to go to the garbage dump, opposed to an hour and a half. Um, we've been promised that for oh, at least five, five or six years. Um, the Chamber of Commerce has been doing their part. They have got a recycling center that is now run by Recycling Partners of Jamaica, who 
could do a lot better. Uh, we, we were able to get them a truck to pick up the plastics. And um, we've begged them to put in a schedule, which they have not done. But they do collect from the schools, which is good. Um, if we can reduce the amount of garbage that goes into the garbage truck, then they can collect more of the, the real garbage. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is we... Um, Mrs. Gail Jackson from Treehouse, she pays a crew to pick up plastic from Orange Bay to the Negro Bridge once a month. She gives out tablets. The amount of bags of garbage that they collect, it's unbelievable. This is from people throwing their bags out of their, out of the car. They go to KFC, they have a drink. They just throw it out the window, which means we have to go back to education. We have to educate our people that we need to put our garbage in a garbage bag. I was out by the Negro sign, the new Negro sign one day, and this gentleman was there with, with all these youngsters. And I was trying to talk to the youngsters and they were ignoring me. So I said to the gentleman, he says, they're my children. I says, you're a Juta driver. Don't you know better than to throw the garbage? He says, you know, I'm Team Jamaica trained. So I know better, but I just didn't think about it. They were dropping their garbage all around the sign. It goes back. We need continuous education all the time because we tend to forget. And to be honest with you, we drive around Jamaica every day and we're so used to seeing the garbage that it no longer registers. It's only when we go pick up a friend or a guest at the airport and we're driving home and they go, oh my God, why is there so much garbage that we open our eyes again and we see this garbage and we're so ashamed and horrified. So we really need to keep reminding people what beautiful countries look like without garbage strewn all over the place. Yeah, I, you hit on two points. One, both we were talking about earlier is the importance of investing in education and environmental education is very, very much a part of that. Um, the second thing is the example that you brought up of Miss Gail Jackson Brooks and her taking her personal resources, private sector, to do the job of what should be a public sector responsibility. And she does an amazing job. You know, you know, shout out to Gail, shout out to Treehouse for doing that. But again, where would the grill be without the efforts of the private sector? I have no idea. And it's a scary thought to think. And I see the pictures on Facebook when they put them on the side. Like, it's crazy the amount of garbage that's there. And what if she doesn't do that? What if she, we don't have a Gail Jackson Brooks? What if we don't have a Rock House Foundation? So on and so forth. Like, what's going to happen to our community? And to me, it's like, like you said, Mr. Grizzle, like, this is a very simple easy fix and it's just like the lowest hanging fruit of everything mm -hmm. that we've talked about here today mm -hmm. and i don't know uh like i guess let's move on to action like what can we do what can be done about this at this point huh again we have to keep going back to the top there is mr jones who is responsible we had him down was it about three months ago sorry who's mr jones the head of um, NSWMA. Yeah. yeah. The head of NSWMA. Responsible for garbage. We have on occasion have the Minister of Local Government, Mr. McKenzie, who has normally very responsive to our. Mm. Yeah. Right. I think we will have to have a meeting with him again. To, I mean, if you look on my phone now, every Sunday morning I'm out there taking Campy as a Pilot, which you know this beautiful place and it's just it's just something about those garbage in the early morning that really drives me nuts mm -hmm. i suppose we just have to get to those two gentlemen because there is nothing else we can do and keep on to them and to them i don't mean to turn this political but what about our local representatives I mean, because this uh, going back to what I'm kind of the ongoing theme here, like this is not our job. No, 
From from what I understand, it's really the um, municipal corporation who is in charge of our garbage. So <laughs> that's what I've been led to understand, yeah. and that the the MP does. I mean, I, obviously, he can lobby to the, the the other ministers and government on a whole on our part. But I, I'm I'm led to believe that it is. I'd like to just share you a little story I had as a child. We were driving along one day behind a minibus and somebody threw out a, a box drink in those days. And my father drove in front of the minibus and stopped them. And he pretended he was a police officer. Mm-hmm. And he told, he told the driver of the minibus to go back and pick up the garbage, which he did. And I'm just wondering if... if once in a while, if a police officer would just target a minibus that's just thrown something out, you know, maybe over time we'll learn to understand. You know, there's little things we can do as, as just regular Jamaicans. You know, you see a child throwing something down. No, don't throw that. Go find a garbage pan. So there's something we can all do as a nation. We can all do these little things to show that it's not right. As you said, the local government is responsible for garbage. We just have a new person as our councillor. And I think I I think we definitely as to ha- bring him to one of our directors meeting. Mm-hmm. We also have a new mayor. Okay. And I spoke to him last week telling him that we will be sending him an invitation an invitation to one of our directors meeting and i think this is some of the issue we can take up directly give these two new people because what we had before never worked it's not that we didn't contact them but in this case the mayor and our councillor were one and the same now we have two different persons. So we will start at the bottom and work our way to the top. Mm-hmm. But I think one other thing we can do with our new counselor is to call him and let's see what he can do to assist us. I think it goes without saying is that we're here to help. You know, we're, we're partners in this together at the end of the day. And we're here to make each other's lives better and the lives of our community members better at the end of the day. So, um, yeah, looking looking forward to that and whenever that happens. Good. Um, in closing out, you know, we've been almost two hours. Yeah, two hours, which is crazy. It's, it's flying by. Um, I really want to close out with the water situation, uh, particularly all of Negril, but definitely the West End, like we said, has felt it the worst. No questions asked. Um what do we what do we tell those folks you know i know a lot of them are watching and and looking for answers and looking for guidance it's like what can we tell them and i i know it's it's beyond us it's beyond our powers but nonetheless like this is happening to a large portion of our community members and and the frustration is there and i really we all really feel for them and, and feel for what's happening to them and all of us you're in the west end well, I, you know, I mean, the, the truth of the matter is is that it's really infrastructure issues that seem to be a part of the, a large part of the problem, and that's a that's a long that's a long term fix for that. I don't know that there's a short term fix for this right now. I mean, as Daniel says, if you don't, if there's no water coming in 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 the pipe, it, can, it doesn't matter if you turn the lock off this way or that way. There's no water in the pipe. You know, and but the situation as it is now is just ridiculous. I mean, you know, the, the you see trucking of water. I drove through Froome the other day where they actually fill up all the truck, where, where a lot of the trucks go to fill. And that where there used to be one spot, the original Froome, where the, where the, the, the spring comes out of the ground, da, 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 that's still there. But down the road, there's another, like four, I think they've, they've set up four more trucking stations there. There's a guy fixing trucks. There's a guy welding trucks there's there's a, it looks like there's a there's a truck uh, uh, a water truck graveyard out there <clears throat> there's a whole industry that is that is obviously relying on the fact that we have no water 
and water is very expensive to buy from trucks, you know, mm -hmm. and getting and, and has been getting more and more expensive <clears throat> as, as almost as if they realise that, that, you know, we can't yeah. do without it. I mean, you know, and we can't do without it. That's obviously what, you know, one of the, the basic standard, yeah? So I don't, I don't really know. It's really about lobbying the government as much as anything else and make sure that the government understand that we're serious about it and that we need to do something or that they need to do something about it. And that, and, and, but I mean, as I say, there's, I don't know if there's a short, ter there's a short term fix. Well, the only short term thing which I think is more a gesture than anything else, the government does have a lot of water shops. And I think where the small people, the residents, are concerned, the government should send some more of their water trucks in the area, and these should be giving people free water. Mm -hmm. I don't think right now it's fair to ask a man in his little two or three bedroom house to pay this huge amount of water out of his little salary just for a basic thing, right? Or if he has to charge, Whatever, when the water comes through your pipe, the cost per gallon, then he shouldn't be charged anymore. And as I really think, the government should stand the bill for their neglect. And I think they could, in the short term, you see, look, look how difficult this thing is. Right now, most of us small hoteliers we're planning, slow time coming, we're going to refurbish, we're going to put money, we're going to be stepping up our advertisement to see if we can have even a better winter than we just had. Right? We are still, you may say, crazy enough to believe in that. Now, the thing is, on the other hand, the government has to put on their thinking cap we are playing our part. We want them to put in, I don't know what the stopgap measure is going to be, but we cannot continue to afford 40, 30, or 40 dollars, depend. Thousand, 40,000. Thousand for water coming up the next winter season. And we see no reason to believe that the situation will be any better. But we want to remain in the business. We want to continue to employ our folks. And the government wants to continue having the tax coming in. So for all that to happen, they have to do something. We cannot go through the next winter season. And we can, a lot of our guests will be calling the, the book to come next Christmas. They'll be calling, as the water situation improves, why are you gonna be a liar? <laughs> no, but it, it's serious. And most small properties in the grill rely heavily on repeat business. And they are going to call, they are aware of the water problem that we have now. And knowing them, they will be calling. I mean, we all know, Every little thing, you get a little email asking you, has this been done, has that been done? Okay. So the government has to have a short-term uh, program in. Whether putting in the pipes from Green Island. Green Island to Negril, is it possible for it to be done in six months? I'm not an expert, I don't know, but let's see something. I think in the, the midterm is, I mean, right now I've spoken to a couple of smaller hoteliers and they're all looking to buy water tanks, bigger water tanks, because most of us have water tanks that last two to three days. So now we're putting in more water tanks to last us hopefully a week. Um, the other thing, <laughs> exactly. Um, the other thing is obviously uh, rainwater harvesting. Um, I'd really like to see, I noticed somebody mentioned it earlier that the plan shouldn't be passed without water harvesting. But I think the government should put in place through the NHT maybe some funding 
or the guttering required and and the tank to do some form of water harvesting i think i think every house should have some form of water harvesting um so that i mean obviously it's not going to last long maybe a couple of days but at least you know it should tide you over because i mean on the west end it's supposed to be three days a week so if you have a tank a, a catchment hopefully that will fill in the gaps when there is no water from the street um so those are little midterm things that could be done to assist but um it's been a really big blow for the smaller operators in, in on the west end and um, it has a, a, an immediate impact on on the society because every dollar earned in those smaller establishments goes straight back into the community on a daily basis it's what sends that kids to school it's you know it's what buys the grocery for dinner tonight and so the impact has been tremendous and and i think we have to understand the social impact as well as the comic economic impact so it, it's a big thing water is life water is life um i i think those are viable short-term solutions or suggestions that can i think they can be implemented pretty quickly and i hope now if, if the powers that be did, hadn't don't understand or didn't understand before that they understand how dire this situation is for many of our residents here in particular and uh i i, I do hope that they get some reprieve relatively soon so um I guess we're going to close it out there. Yeah, we've hit gone over the two hour mark and uh, I want to thank you all for joining us here today. But I also want to give you all the opportunity to say any, you know, last minute words or messaging that you that you want to want to tell the audience here and tell the, the community. So I can start with you. Jamie. All right. I, I just like to say that I think I'm actually really pleased to be living in the grill and there are some amazing people in the grill and it is a beautiful place. I mean, I know what we talk about today is is sounds very negative but there are a lot of real pluses about being in the grill and about you know the 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 west end or the beach and and that there's a really good energy in the grill there's a lot of really people who people come here to, to enjoy themselves like i mean you know there's a reason this is that that we generate so much um, tourism dollars because it's a great place to come to and you know like talking to the guests everyone just loves coming to the grill and and it does really have a real casual vibe about it that actually that works really well with with holidaying and and and, and there's a great place to live too and but as i said that there's just there is such a great community of people in the grill largely and so i just don't want it to seem like everything is down and bad that there are some really good things about being here thanks winthrop well i would just like to say i've been in the grill now for some 40 odd years i enjoy living in the grill and one other thing that first attracts me to Negril is this whole community existence. And I want us to continue. But I also want us to realize that all of us has a responsibility to try to do our best to maintain this beautiful resort and to be in a position so we can always be a viable tourism entity we can do it and we need the help of each and every one don't be afraid to approach your political representative and you are not going to be green or orange you are a jamaican and more important you are a negrillian and that's what we are and where we see our leaders are not stepping up we must not be afraid to call them out. Sometimes people say you get the kind of government that you deserve. We deserve better, but we have to push as well. Thank you, Mr. Gresham. Sophie? Well, after these two great speeches, I'm kind of a loss for words. Um, well, I'm second generation Chamber of Commerce. My parents were founding members, so I grew up in the Chamber of Commerce. And it's true, a lot of these issues have been going on for 30, 40 years. I mean, some of these issues, if you go back and look at the Chamber of Minutes, you know, 30 years ago, we're still talking about some of the same issues. But then there has been a lot of improvements and, you know, Jamaica as a whole has improved tremendously. Um, our airport accesses have improved and 
as a whole, we, we, we've done a lot of great things. So, you know, I'm very proud to be part of the Negro community. Um, we're always trying very hard to do our best to advocate the chamber, to advocate for all the things that Negro does need. And, you know, it's such a pleasure when you see them coming to fruition. And I'm just hoping you have to always stay positive. And so I'm hoping that, you know, by next year, this time, a lot of these issues will have been solved or partially solved. And, and then we can move on to the next wish list that we have for Negro. So um, as Damien and my father said, we're all very happy to be part of the Negro community. And a big thank you for Thropex for always putting oh, these yes. issues on the, uh, out there. And we couldn't have done such a great job without Winthrop with us. Thank you, thank you. And thank you all for taking the time to, to come here. And it just is a testament to all of you guys' commitment to this community and how much it means to, to you all. So um, thank you all for being here. And as far as like my, my closing statement, I would want to thank you all, the audience, for joining us here today. Uh, I hope we learned something uh, more than anything else. I would love to take some action and eventually get some results from this. And this is, as I opened up with, not our normal type of content, not our normal type of live stream, but it just got to a breaking point that it just had to be done at the end of the day. So I will continue to advocate for Jamaica being a wonderful, beautiful place to invest and to live, and especially in the grill. There is no other place in Jamaica that I could find or see myself living. I uh, absolutely love it here. And as Damien says, there are a lot of great things about this community, a lot of great people here as well. And I feel so lucky, so fortunate to be able to call this place my home. I mean, every day I, I get up with like a super high level of gratitude to be able to go out and look at the beach or go for a run or even to be able to call everybody here my friends and my colleagues and i just believe there's just so much potential here and we haven't even we're just at the tip of the iceberg at the end of the day and we are oh i should say i'm lucky enough to have friends and colleagues that take this place as serious as i do and are willing to do whatever it takes to ensure that it gets to the next level and it reaches its full potential. So once again, thank you all so much for joining us here today. And we're gonna get back to our, our regular live stream tomorrow at 12 o'clock. It'll be our normal subject matter, but I appreciate you all taking the time and share this video with anybody who you think should listen, should hear, or perhaps could help move all of these challenges that we're facing forward. Thank you once again. Have a great Saturday, everybody. Peace.